Well, Valbin talks about two particular values. It says you should report both the technical value, which is effectively the discounted cash flow method to talk about the future net economic benefit at the valuation date under a set of assumptions deemed most appropriate. That effectively is what I've just been describing for the last 40 or 50 minutes. It also requires you to, to give what's called the fair market value, which is effectively the, the, the value of the asset would trade out on an arm's length basis. So you can think of the technical value as the underlying bottom-up approach. The fair market value is effectively what top-down approach, what, the, what would the market actually pay for it? There's a lot of debate around, well, everyone's clear that reserves have value because people are buying and selling reserves all the time. And a lot of um, exchanges are sort of saying, well, do, do resources actually have any value? If I haven't discovered it, does it have any value at all? From the work we do, it's quite clear that there's a lot of people, a lot of on-gas companies who do place some value on on resources and even perspective resources. We see what's called farm-ins and farm-outs all the time. That's when companies trade interests in expiration licenses. And quite often, the person farming in, acquiring the interest, will, will not necessarily pay cash, but certainly will carry the other partner for a certain amount of cash, but then it pay, pay their share of costs. We've seen, and we've been involved in, some flotations, and especially on the London market, of companies that have come to the London Stock Exchange to the main board with no reserves at all, okay? There's a company on there now, we call it Ophir Energy, which we worked on, I think has a market cap of $2 billion plus. It hasn't got a single barrel of reserves, okay? So there's a lot of faith being put in the future value of, of their um, portfolio. We see a lot of asset sales where big money is changing hands on properties that have no reserves at all. The big question to me is not whether the resources have value, but how should we value them? I and mean, that's the issue to me. I think a lot of exchanges are saying, well, they don't have value. They're actually trying to, they're dodging the issue. It is complicated. So what they're saying is, well, we don't know how to do it. Let's just not do it at all. But I don't think it actually serves the investor well. What we should be saying is, well, how should we value them? We should do some work on the methodologies because there are a host of methodologies, some shortcuts, some long-winded long approaches like I've been on. So what is appropriate? The guidelines are quite vague on what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate. We would always value resources on an, an expected monetary value approach, the, the approach I've been describing. And to do that, I need to assess recoverable volume ranges. I need to assess chances of development, discovery. I need to estimate costs. And I need to know the fiscal terms. Okay? The alternative is to look at the market and what does the market do? Well, the market does it on factory transactions, transaction values. What are people paying for assets? So I say these are two different values which may or may not coincide. So there's the technical value, and there's what I call the fair market value. The best way I could analogy I could think of that is buying and selling a house or, or an apartment. When you go to sell a house or an apartment, you might get an expert in, a property agent. He'll come in and will assess where the, where the house is, how many bedrooms it is, how much area it's got, what state it's in, and give you a range of values, technical values, and what you might get to achieve if you were to sell it. What you physically get, well, it could be, it could be that range, it could be less than that, it could be more than that. It really depends on the competition. If there's only one person interested in buying your property, then you're unlikely to achieve the price you want. If there are 10 people fighting for it, then you might well achieve way above the expected value that you've got for your property. And that's what we, effectively what we see in all the time, that the people are the, if there's no interest in the property, it can quite often change in the hands at a discount. If there's a lot of interest, and really it's about having the, what we call in the upstream set, having the right address, or so there's certain areas which are really hot because of recent discoveries, then people will pay big money and over the top to get into it. We've worked with companies in Tanzania with a lot of interest in, in the in big gas discoveries, and people are paying big money or prepared to big money to get hold of exploration acreage in Tanzania because of the future potential. Here's an example of one that we worked on. I think hopefully will demonstrate that there is significant value in resources. And this is in the public domain, so we can disclose it. In about 2010, we were working on what was called a class one transaction. In other words, that's a transaction which for a company called Heritage Oil and Gas, 
which is a small UK-based oil and gas company, mainly exploration, tiny amount of reserves in, in Siberia, but a large amount of the resources, most of which was undrilled. They had a, a big interest in Uganda, in Lake Albert. They had some small sub-commercial discoveries, commercial because it hadn't got over a, a threshold you know, to enable the export of the oil. But if you could overcome that hurdle, it would be commercial. And a lot of expression acreage with um, potential value. So we went through that process of doing a full probabilistic valuation. So here's just the expected values, the means of the distributions. And we came up with a considered opinion that we felt that this acreage would be worth, future value of this acreage is $1.6 billion, not a barrel of reserves to be seen. Okay. Within six months later, Tallow effectively bought into that acreage and paid Heritage $1.45 billion in cash to buy out Heritage Oil and Gas. So if someone tells me that resources determine in value, I always point to this and say, well, you know, we're not talking here of you know, a small farm and of $10 million. We're talking about $1.45 billion of cash paid for nothing but exploration prospects. So finally, what we would say is, it, is that we would go through a process of valuing the reserves. The reserves by default are unrisked, so it's, it's what we know to be there. We don't know the exact volumes, so we may well work out the value of the 1P, 2P, 3P case. We might even work out the mean value, the expected net present value of the reserves. We'll assess all the resource values. We'll do those on a risk basis because we're doing an expected monetary value, so we've got to include the possibility of drawing dry holes. You can't just assume that they're successful and add up the the value of the, fee, of the prospects if we were discovered, because obviously you don't discover that many. Most of the time it'll be dry holes. And from those two, we might come up with a range of technical values from a bottom-up approach. What the market will pay, as I say, is very much a case of, of being in the right place at the right time and being effectively how much competition there is. So if you're in offshore Mozambique or, um, or Tanzania right now, you might pay quite a lot. If you were in Uganda two years ago, you paid a hell of a lot of money for expiration. So the market really value is complete. So now the, the other issue we've got, particularly with, with fair market values, especially when we're dealing with companies with lots of resources, is that quite often there are no transactions reported in which to base the, tra the, the analysis. So quite often the only transactions reported are on reserves. Or if it's a complicated ac acquisition, they don't break the value down, so you can't apportion how much was paid for the every barrel of reserves and how much was paid for the expiration acreage. So if we go to Valmin, which insists I produce a fair market value, I once did one evaluation of some expiration acreage in the Black Sea in Romania. Well, there aren't any transactions to go on. There are transactions I could pull in from the North Sea, but they're totally inapplicable. So how am I supposed to get a fair market value if I've got no reserve transactions to go on? But I think there's obviously a, there's a, there's a flaw in the fair market value. I can generate the technical value because I can go through the bottom-up approach, but I can't possibly get to a meaningful um, market value for that. Not until someone actually, actually goes out and pays the money and then at least got one data point. So in summary, the reserves and resources are the drivers of value in the company. The relationship in the reserves and resources, hopefully I've demonstrated from or the way all companies approach it, is, is not simple. There's no, no magic conversion of a barrel to, to a value. I know lots of people would say, what's the MPV for barrel? Can't I just use that and convert volumes to, 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 to value instantly? The value of the portfolio cannot be determined from just the total reserves and resources. So you can't just take the answer. The bottom line is how I magically think, well, can't I convert that to the value of the expiration or the, or the, or the producing assets? The whole value itself may be subject to commercial and fiscal synergies. You need to take those into account. If you try to do proper market values and get close to market values, then you need to value it in a, in a full and proper way. The value of reserves is also, should also express as a range. If the volumes are expressed as a range, we'd always expect to see the values expressed over the same range. So if you ever see the company that just gives you the value of one value, I'd always ask, like I do with the volumes, well, what, what's the range of value for this, these assets, not just, just the one number? And then we get to resources, they should always include the risk, the cost of failure, and also the value of success. And that should be expressed over a similar range. 
if you're going to, 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 to a casino, whether it's in Singapore or in Monte Carlo, and you're going to play uh, and bet on in the, in, the, in the casino, you don't need to know three things when you walk through the door if you want to actually stand any chance of coming out with, some, with any money at the end of the day. How much does it cost to play? How much I'm going to win? And what's the chance of winning? If you don't understand those, you shouldn't be entering the casino. Okay? You, all right? So that's all we're doing with expected monetary values, is assessing the chance of it working, how much am I going to gain if, if it works. If it doesn't work, how much am I going to lose? You need to know all of those, not just one piece of that. And that's and that. Thank you very much.